am truly a delight to uh, introduce my very, very dear friend, Luana Marquez. Um, and I'm so grateful that you were able to come and talk to us today. Uh, for those of you that aren't aware, she's a, a very uh, sought after commodity, so to speak, a very sought after speaker. Um, she's the current president of the ADAA, which is the Anxiety and Depression Association of America. Uh, Luana is also the co-director of the MGH Center for Anxiety and Traumatic Stress Disorder. She's also the director of PRIDE, which is a community psychiatry program based in the community uh, that is a, around, um, <clears throat> primarily, it's around research and, and, and um, uh, implementation and dissemination research. <clears throat> She's been on Face the Nation, New York Times, Huff Post, Washington Post, ABC, CBS, all the letters, MSNBC, WBUR. Um, and now we have her very, very gratefully um, to speak to us here in Chelsea. But I think most importantly, and we talked about this before the call started, uh, Luana was very excited to come and talk to us because she has uh, just an incredible commitment and passion to community work. Um, and because of that, she and I have become very good friends um, over many, many years and because we share that same passion. So you will hear that and I'm so grateful that you could take time out of your very busy schedule to come and share all of your wonderful knowledge with us, my dear. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Um, and thank you, everybody. I'm going to share my screen and then Thank you again, Mary, um, for that wonderful introduction and Jen for inviting me. And then for all of you that I saw your faces before we jumped in, um, as you know, Chelsea is my community. And so it's an honor to be here speaking to you today so that we can trade some ideas. I prepared a very brief presentation that Jen felt was helpful to all of you, but then I'll leave plenty of time for us to chat and, and trade ideas and for me to find ways to be of service to our community. So I wanna start by talking about how I think um, for many of us, it really, we need to think about how it's okay not to be okay. And I wanna talk a little bit, about why is it that it's okay for us to really have some tough moments right now? Well, as we think about Chelsea, there is a real threat that goes above and beyond COVID-19. There is a significant threat to individuals' health, as you know, six times higher infection rate in Chelsea than in Mass. There is a threat to food supply. And one of the things that I keep hearing again and again, and in fact shared with um, somebody in policy today, is the need for the basic needs for our community, that food and diapers are something that, that, that our community doesn't have. In addition to a threat to shelter, of course those threats were there before COVID-19, but this pandemic has amplified the need of our diverse communities and how they are being hit the hardest by this pandemic. And so why it's okay to not be okay? Well, when our body faces a threat, a real threat, it activates our limbic system, the fight or flight part of our brain, the part that basically is biologically wired to get us out of trouble, to get us out of danger. And when that limbic system is activated, immediately what happens is you feel your body tensing up. Your heart is going to pound. You notice that you, you're tense, you're ready to fight, fight or freeze. That is a biologically adaptive response that all of us have in the aftermath of a threat. So when we think about that response, I like to think about it in the respect of anxiety and really the spectrum of arousal and anxiety. And when is it too much? How do we know if our anxiety is too much? And then what we do about it? So the yates dobson Law teaches us about the relationship between our own arousal, our anxiety, the stress response that I just talked about, and our ability to do our job, our ability to perform, our ability to care for those that we love so much. And what do we know about this? Well, in the left of the curve here, when we have very low levels of arousal, we also have very low levels of performance. If you drink coffee, you experience this every morning as sort of that sluggish and sleepiness before you have that first cup of coffee. Then your brain starts to kick in and there is an optimal level of arousal that also leads to an optimal level of performance. Many of us have had experience of this and call about being, on the, being in the zone when you feel like your brain is working for you and you're on, you're activated, you're not sluggish, but your performance is at peak performance. 
Well, as this pandemic has started and has gone on from this chronic acute to a much more chronic level of stress, what many of us have experienced is actually coming off of that zone to the place where at times you may have experienced intense levels of stress, anxiety, and that has an impact on your ability to perform. We've heard this from some of our frontline workers that when they're going in and out, they're in and out, they're doing such amazing job and we're so thankful, but their body is under this chronic level of stress and uncertainty. And when we're there, you might notice three things that are indicators that your body's off the zone a little bit and that we need to do something to bring you back. The first is what you're saying to yourself. When anxiety gets to too much, our thinking gets particularly black and white and very catastrophic. You might hear yourself saying things like, there's nothing I can do about this. I'm never able to support my family. I would never able to support my family again. The world is temporarily closed. I'll never be able to get housing. Now, those statements have some truth to them. But often when we're saying that again and again, we find ourselves spinning. And it affects our emotions. You might feel a lot more tense, a lot more tired, a lot more hopeless, which then will affect what we do, our behaviors. And so you might have found yourself sometimes having a hard time getting up in the morning, feeling a little stuck. Now, those are biologically normal responses to a chronic stress situation. But what we want to do is make sure that we're not there. We make sure that we give you some tools that you can use for getting back to the zone. And when I think about this, and I think about how can I best help our community, I think about growing up in Brazil. I think about growing up in a very challenged situation with a single mother and, and reminding her a time when we really had one potato for the three of us to eat. And so what would my mom needed during those times? What are things that could have helped her to keep going despite of this chronic stress? And I think the things that we need is really to remind ourselves that, yes, we're having this limbic response as fight or flight, but there are skills, there are evidence-based science-driven skills that actually activate our thinking brain the one that helps us be able to plan, engage, and continue to keep going. I think about three um, particular skills, in fact, four, um, that will help us unplug, cool off our brain. So unplug and anchor, charging up, staying connected, and being of service. And I just wanna take a minute to share with you why I think those skills are helpful and what you can do no matter where you are right now. So when we're plugged, and here is plugged all the time, for example, watching the news, what we know is that we're activating the fight or flight part of our brain. So research after the Boston bom Maritime bombing showed that people that are watching six or more hours of news a day actually have a higher stress response than those that were actually there um, during the bombing. And so we know that being on, specifically watching a lot of news, have a negative effect in our body. So how do we unplug? How much the news? And I, I, a lot of you have asked me this. Well, so I'm going to unplug. I still want the news. And in fact, our brain's craving at times. I recommend that you go back to what you should do before. So if you're the kind of person that watches the news maybe once or twice a day, go back to that. Um, if we look at the World Health Organization, the recommendation is actually once or twice a day. The trick, I think, for me is this. If I'm sitting there trying to catch up on the news and I notice that stress response, I notice my body tensing up, I notice my thoughts are racing, that's a moment to unplug. But the fact is, once your brain's racing, I recommend that you unplug and you anchor. So you turn off the TV and you say, you know what, what am I going to do? Maybe I'm going to go for a walk. Maybe I'm going to reach out to somebody. Maybe I'm going to have a cup of tea. But we have to actually actively help our brain to get to a place that's anchoring on something good so they can start to cool off. Now, charging up. What, why charge up? Well, our bodies are actually quite similar to the batteries of our car. If we don't drive our cars, our batteries die. And for all of us right now, we're in this constant state of like, what do we do? And sometimes we forget to take attention to some of the things that we need. Eating, sleeping, and exercise. For many in our communities, those are privileges right now. And so we might not be able to fully charge up, 
but we might be able to play with our kids. We might be able to cook a meal for our neighbors or to raise money for Chelsea, like Mary suggested that her community did. So really finding ways to jumpstart our batteries. The reason I urge you to really think about movement and staying active is because it brings you back to the zone. It activates your thinking brain. It pulls off your limbic response. Next, I wanna talk a little bit about staying connected. Research shows us that face-to-face -face connection compared to Facebook, the Facebook connection can also lead to decreased depression, decreased anxiety, and increased satisfaction in life. Now, we don't wanna be living in this world, and the reality is very challenging for all of us. In fact, before we start, I said to some of my um, friends in this call, I just felt like this real sense of connection with them because their faces, the people that I really love. And I could feel the opposite of the stress response. I felt a sense of like, I'm part of the community. And so uh, my own experience moments before this conversation demonstrated how staying connected with those that you love can really increase your well-being. And so how to do it? I think by now, many of us have created very um, creative ways to do this, which is by using things like Zoom. You know, a, a couple of months ago, I'd be sitting there with you talking in person. But as much as we can, finding ways to connect through social media um, and also thinking about those around us that can't do this. And so I've been urging a lot of our officials, our public officials, to really think about how to provide Wi-Fi for our um, communities for kids who need to do their homework. And so um, I know personally that staying connection can be a privilege through um, any kind of, of um, electronic means. But if you can, I urge you to do it. And if you can support those that can't, I also think that's important. Finally, I want to actually thank our frontline and all of those that have been of service, even not only those that are actually in the front lines, but many of my colleagues here who have turned their lives upside down and found ways to reinvent themselves and to provide service from their home so that our population who needed mental health service could access it. And it is challenging for all of us. It's no small token to actually have to reinvent how you do your business and how to reinvent how you do your craft. And that has significant impact and a huge learning curve. But I want to assure all of us that being of service is so important. And many of you know this, but it also decreased depression and increased happiness. And, and for me personally, I can attest that I've been doing a lot of this. And when I finish this kind of conversations with my colleagues and friends and, and other people, I feel like I was able to share a little bit of what I know so that others perhaps can use some of those skills. I know that the city of Chelsea has done an amazing job of calling from volunteers in English and Spanish. And I know that many of you here have actually volunteered. And I just wanted to put a plug that if you haven't yet, um, there's really an opportunity to be of service um, in many different ways. As you can see here, from food assistance, financial impacts, elderly. Um, I think our community has been hit so hard and we really need to find ways to connect. So today I talked very briefly at a high level, this ability of activating our thinking brain, of thinking about what it is that we can do to turn on our thinking brain and decrease that limit response. The idea of disconnecting and, and really your brain will thank you. I know that often in moments of uncertainty like this, of heightened uncertainty, our brain is craving information. It's trying to get some certainty. Unfortunately, the only certainty that we have right now is uncertainty. And so it's important for us to give our brain a break and be able to anchor on something good. Walking, mindfulness, meditation, being able to just have a moment to take a breath. The other day, somebody asked me, did you breathe today? And I thought it was odd for a second. And then I realized that I really hadn't taken a moment to just be able to be in that present moment. Second, thinking about our bodies like the battery of our cars and really finding creative ways to charge it up. Eating, sleep, and exercise have never um, been something that's optional. For many of us, it's a privilege. And I remember very vividly what that felt like as a young kid in Brazil. But reminding ourselves that by actually 
moving our bodies and finding ways to support our community so that they can have their basic needs we are able to actually help our brains as well. Talked about staying connected and the importance of um, connecting with others to decrease depression. Currently, in many ways, I think about the situations that all of us are facing as a bit of a petri dish for depression. Isolation, lack of social support, lack of connection, in addition to the real difficulties of lack of shelter and food and, and the basic needs. So really the best that we can stay connected to our loved ones or reaching out to those that need somebody to talk to. And finally, really thanking all of you for being of service and calling others that are listening to this. If there's small ways that you can be of service, calling an elderly, providing um, food for those that need, buying diapers and dropping off in the health center at Chelsea, this is the moment for us to come together as a community. I really think that um, Chelsea has done an amazing job on aligning, and I know that the CCHI folks have been part of this, we're in this call. Several of my STEAM colleagues have sort of created this collaborative together, the One Chelsea Fund, um, the line for people to be able to get food and emergency response. And here, I wanted to just really thank you all for doing this and to remind the rest of us that there's an opportunity to do that. Now. It's not all bad. I started by saying, you know, it's okay not to be okay. And I wanted you to walk away today, giving yourself permission to hit that wall at times and reminding yourself that your body's having an adaptive response, but it may be too much right now. But I wanted to sort of end with the reminding, reminding all of us that we are extremely resilient, right? The fact that I'm here speaking to you today, coming from where I came from, is an, it, it's a clear experience explanation of resilience. And, and that's why I wanted to be here with you today, to be able to sort of share my story and that to remind us that even at times when I didn't have anything to eat, I thought that the world could be better. And I wanted us to remind ourselves that it's going to get better. Finally, I want to share some additional resources with you so that we can have plenty of time for Q&A. Um, some of this are um, quite fun. So we did um, a webinar with Harvard um, Health Publishing, and now they're also available in Spanish. The easiest way, you can either Google them or you can go to my website, which is just drluana.com. You can link to each website there, each webinar there as well. We are creating currently, um, through the, the generosity of Dali Philanthropies, an online course that we're thinking about this as mental health for all. The idea is to take cognitive behavior therapy and think about his skills, right? I often share the story that I learned CBT from my grandmother. And so we're taking those specific skills and we're chunking them in a bit of an interactive course. And those are gonna be available in several languages and it'll be available for free for all. We'll be releasing it by June 22nd. So if you're interested in more about that, feel free to send me an email. Um, once it's out, we'll be able to share it with you. And um, there is a global resource page on my personal website that we put up as well. So, and it's available, there's some things in Portuguese, in German, in Japanese, and a few other languages. Um, finally, um, this is a sneak peek. Um, so in the beginning of the pandemic, I reached out to some of my colleagues at a platform called Odin. They create online material for youth to try to bridge science and media. And I had this idea that we needed to create something that was interactive for our youth. So they came up with this idea of a mental wellness checklist. So if you're gonna charge up, what are the three steps that you have to do? And um, the CEO of this company was generous enough to fund this project. The first video will come out this Friday. And the reason I'm sharing with you is there are two minute videos. They're gonna be super interactive and it was recorded with me and some celebrities. For example, Max Carver, who's gonna be the new Batman is one of the people that I interviewed to create the checklist. And so I think this is gonna be particularly helpful as a preventive measure for our youth. I think they're gonna connect with the actors and the celebrities, and that might be a way for us to disseminate to our um, community at large, but I think kids in particular are gonna like um, some of the, um, the fun part of this project. 
I want to really thank you all for this opportunity. Um, I said to Mary in the beginning, I almost had tears in my eyes of just how um, important Chelsea is to me and how privileged I feel that you gave me this time to talk to you. And um, thank you for all you're doing. And if there's anything else I can do to be of service, please let me know. I'll stop sharing my slides so I can see your lovely faces and hear more um, questions.